if I knew, I'd probably be making millions of dollars as a political <laughs> Tom Frieden and and uh, people like that, people who, who spend their time thinking about global public health, are doing a lot of work trying to advocate for you know more funding for the CDC and, and more disease detection elsewhere. There are some members of Congress who I'll, I'd point to as, as people who have done uh, a lot of work to, to try to highlight the, the danger that a virus like this faces. Chris Coons is a senator from Delaware who, when he got to the Senate, he, he took what had been Joe Biden's seat back in, uh, what was it, 20, 20, well, whenever that was, 2010 maybe. And he, when he came to the Senate, Biden effectively told him, hey, you, you know, pick a specialty and, and be really good at one thing while you're here. And his the specialty that he picked was Africa. He had been a missionary in Kenya. He'd written a book on apartheid South Africa. And it and he turned into this this sort of evangelist for Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was the the president of Liberia. She just recently, like two months ago, stepped down uh, after. It, there's there's a happy thing, by the way. Uh, in just the last few months, uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone have undergone peaceful transfers of power, which is pretty impressive mm-hmm. for uh, for parts of Africa. So, but he he became sort of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's contact in Congress and advocated for a lot more spending, a lot more quickly on fighting this disease. So there there are some members of Congress who are thinking about this. There are some public agencies who are doing what they can to, to either save every penny so that they can spend it on something like this or just spending it as, as fast as they can. But, you know, there's there's still a lot more to be done. And there's a lot more conversations to be had about how important it is to save a life in, in Liberia, because eventually that life, if it if that virus is able to to spread it's going to come here i mean uh, again there you know no travel ban is going to stop anything like this it's this is we live in a globalized society whether it's something like trade or viruses things travel across the world and there's, there's not much we can do to stop them you also mention in the book the cdc has a private foundation that yeah. isn't uh, as tied to you know they don't have to wait for congressional approval to spend their funding can you talk a little bit about what that is yeah, it's totally cool. It's called the CDC Foundation. It was set up by Congress effectively to go around Congress. You know, when the government buys a whole bunch of stuff, whatever it happens to be, they have to go through this massive uh, contracting process, right? And you ask for bids and, and the process has to be open and whatever. Well, when you've got a virus racing through West Africa, you don't have time to, to ask for bids. You just have to get stuff there. And so the CDC Foundation started raising a bunch of money. They, they usually raise money from, you know, big healthcare firms and, and hospital chains and things like that. People who want, Johnson & Johnson always gives them a ton of money. People who want some some credit, and of course, they want CDC to buy their stuff too. So uh, they, they it, CDC Foundation ended up getting a lot of money from big uh, philanthropies like the, the Gates Foundation, the Paul Allen's Foundation. Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan gave a lot of money. And instead of giving the money for a specific purpose. Let me say that a different way. Paul Allen, for example, gave a lot of money to buy emergency operations centers that effectively were the headquarters of the responses in all three countries. He he paid some, you know, somewhere around 13 million bucks to build these these state of the art facilities in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea. But somebody like Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan wrote a check and told CDC the foundation, you know, spend the money however you want, just tell us in the end how you spent it. And their money went to buy 206 Toyota pickup trucks, which became the ambulances that people would take. You know, when 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 somebody would go pick up a, either a dead body or somebody who needed treatment, those were the ambulances. And some other CDC money went to buy 400 motorbikes that would speed a blood sample from a from a hospital to a laboratory. And basically, what they figured out is that the faster you identify and start treating somebody with Ebola, the better chance they have of living. And they cut the time by which a sample would be would be uh, actually tested from a couple of days to a couple of hours. Like, great, that saved a ton of lives. And there were some other people who bought body bags and and chlorine solution, and, you know, things that, that you don't think of as, as important or, or terribly sexy, something you want to brag about, but that's what they needed. And there were a lot of cases in which, you know, somebody would ask the CDC Foundation for funding for, say, a training program to train contact tracers or for, you know, to purchase whatever supplies they needed. They'd ask for the for the funding in the morning and they'd have it by the afternoon. So it, it was an incredibly nimble operation. And the, the CDC Foundation itself had a little bit of trouble because they started getting donations that they weren't used to. Uh, you know, they're used to 
a couple of big seven figure checks every year. Well, you know, Paul Allen owns the Seattle Seahawks and he flashed the, you know, donate here to the CDC foundation up on the big screen when they were playing some home games. And so CDC foundation started getting all these 10 and 20 and $50 contributions and they'd never seen that before. And uh, it was a, a, a cool moment and sort of a, a change in, in philanthropy, uh, the, the philanthropic model, instead of a lot of people doing what Paul Allen did, which is, Hey, here's, you know, money for a specific project. A lot of people did what the Zuckerbergs did, which was, here's a lot of money, go spend it, you know, and then tell us later how you spent it. Do you have a favorite story from this book? There are, there are a couple of them. This is one of the really cool things that, that I discovered was there were a lot of people in West Africa, West Africans themselves, who could have had much better, easier, probably uh, more you know, richer lives. I, I say richer, I mean financially richer, not culturally richer, you know, if they'd moved to Europe or the U.S. But instead, they stayed, and they did, they, they did what they could to make their own countries better. One of the stories I tell is about a guy named Mosaka Fala, who was a an epidemiolo- is an epidemiologist in in Liberia, and he is he, he grew up in the slums of of Monrovia in a, a neighborhood called Chicken Soup Factory, and he made it to Harvard where he got his PhD. I mean, I can't imagine a starker you know socioeconomic gap than than going from a, a, a slum in Liberia to the halls of Harvard. And when he went back, he he was he led these teams of contact tracers through the uh, the slums of Monrovia to try to figure out, try to find people with Ebola, try to find people who had been in contact with them and, uh, and, and find them, treat them, sort of stop the next generation of the virus. And at one point, his, his team had been sent to see a woman whose eight-year-old son had come into contact with, uh, with someone with Ebola. And this team, you know, they show up in the, in the scary, terrifying moon suits that you think of when you think of the movie like Outbreak or something like that. Uh, and the woman was terrified. She didn't want to uh, say anything about where her son was. She denied that she'd ever reported uh, that he had been in contact because of the stigma of having Ebola uh, in, in this slum. If her family had had Ebola, they would have been shunned, kicked out of, the, of, their, of their home. And I mean, it would have been an absolute disaster for the family that was already barely scraping by to begin with. So the next day, Mosa Kafala drives into this uh, this slum, parks a couple of blocks away from the woman's uh, house, and walks in, no moon suit, no nothing, just him, walks in and brings her lunch. And they sat there, they had lunch, they talked, and eventually the woman tells him that, you know, the boy's father is abusive, and, and sometimes he comes and, and picks the boy up and takes him away for days at a time. What she needed at that moment was a few dollars to get on a motorbike taxi and go find the kid. So Fala takes some money out of his pocket and hands it to her, and she says she can't take this bill because it's too crisp. Nobody in the slums has has a bill that's this crisp. So eventually, Mosaka Fala went to a, a little farm stand, bought something small, exchanged his crisp bill for some you know more uh, worn currency that it had been circulating in the slums, and went back, gave it to her. She zipped off on a motorcycle, and the next day they had they had the boy, and he, he survived. And and in in relating that story, the guy who told me that story, who has since passed away, was a a, a Swedish epidemiologist named Hans Rosling, and his point in telling me that was you can do all the all the cool epidemiology or immunology or, or whatever uh, uh, hard science you want but in the end fighting an outbreak is about anthropology too and it's about understanding the the cultural differences and the cultural needs of w- whatever the impacted population is and therefore something like anthropology can be just as important as as the hard sciences like biology or epidemiology is there anything else that you want to make sure we talk talk about yeah, I'd, I'd just say that the next outbreak is coming. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when, because of sort of three major factors. We talked about the uh, explosion of the middle class in Asia and Africa, which means that we're just a more interconnected world that, that travels more, that interacts more with uh, between countries. So that sort of pr- prepares the world for a, a spread of, of something like this. The second factor is, you know, cities are growing. The human population is growing farther and farther into nature. It's a confrontation for which neither side, neither the humans nor the nature, is terribly well prepared. And then we've got the the climate change factor, which is growing the tropics and the subtropics where a lot of these viruses live. But just because the next outbreak is coming doesn't mean that we can't be prepared. And I think that at the very least, what this outbreak did was it it prepared American agencies to, to do a better job in responding to the next one. 
It prepared the World Health Organization, which has gone through a remarkable round of introspection and self-flagellation, basically. It prepared the, the World Health Organization to do a better job than the woefully inadequate job they did here. And it shone a spotlight on a, a problem that is that, that the world has to confront. And the question is, are we going to do that? Are we going to spend those millions now to save those, not just billions of dollars, but also thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives farther down the road? If we, if we make that collective decision to do it and to, and to put in place the sort of virus surveillance that we need, then the next outbreak isn't going to be as bad as it possibly could be. But if we don't, then we, we ignore the warnings of, of Herman Big. He said a uh, hundred years ago that, hey, we can do this if we put the money towards it. Well, the question is, are we going to actually do that? Yeah, you talk in the book about if it's something that's as deadly as Ebola, but as virulent as the flu, mm -hmm. you know, how terrible that would be. And I remember reading that. I've got two young kids at home, so we've gone through norovirus a lot in my house. <laughs> and I remember thinking, or if it's as virulent as norovirus, you know, that just, you're exposed at all, you're going to get it. And thinking about something that is so deadly like Ebola combined right. with that would be really terrible. Right. And, you know, right now there is, so this year, the, the flu that was so bad around the U.S., there were there were these two strains that were going around. One is H1N1. We all know that as, as the bird flu. And the second one was this strain called H3N2, which for some reason is particularly resistant to vaccines. So the vaccine effectiveness rate this year was really low. The thing that scares public health officials is a, a, a flu that would be much more deadly than any of these current flus that are going around and as easily transmissible as some of these flus that are going around. There is, not to, not to terrify anybody, but there is a flu right now in China called H7N9 that has a mortality rate that's somewhere like 40%. I mean, it's crazy high. The good news is it's not that transmissible. It, it is the outbreaks that have happened in the last few years have been very, very small. But the bad news is it's not that transmissible yet. Viruses mm -hmm. are very small and they can mutate in, in dramatic ways just because there aren't that many strands of RNA to actually mutate. Any mutation can make something more deadly or less deadly, more transmissible or less transmissible, or it might have no change whatsoever, no effect whatsoever. If H7N9 mutates in some in some way and becomes a lot more transmissible, you know that's that's the one that everybody that keeps everybody up at night. All right, I'm gonna go wrap my kids in protective <laughs> wrap. <laughs> Just don't go to any bird markets in China and you'll be fine. <laughs> Reed, thank you so much for coming on now that you've really scared me. <laughs> I really enjoyed this book. I remember how closely I was watching this whole thing unfold when it first sort of hit the American consciousness and sort of tracking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember like, what's this person's next temperature reading going to be? The stranger whom I've never met, who may have Ebola. Are they going to have a fever next time they check in? You know, and anyone who likes suspense thrillers, this very much, you know, has the kind of pacing of something like that but it but is real and has an impact is important cool well hey thanks for having me i really appreciate it yes thanks so much and everybody go check out can you tell us the whole title again epidemic uh, ebola and the global scramble to prevent the next killer outbreak and i set up a cool little website for it epidemicbook.com if you want to take a look there there are even some like videos and behind the scenes photos that show where this thing actually came from all right and it's available in bookstores already got my copy on my kindle so check it out Hello, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, and I am here in this segment with Dr. Harold Tepernani, who is running for Congress in the Arizona 8th District. Hello. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak with you and your listeners. Yes, thanks so much for coming on. So could you start by telling us a little bit about your background and why you're running for Congress? I'd love to. So my background is I'm a first-generation immigrant. Came to this country when I was three years old. My parents immigrated from India and eventually grew up on the west side of Cleveland in Ohio. So I was product of public schools and went to medical school in Ohio and eventually went to the University of Michigan for my training in emergency medicine. My husband also trained out in Michigan, and after we were done with residency, we came out to Arizona, where I've been for 21 years. And I basically lived within two miles of where I live now, and I've been here for 
like I said, over two decades. And I've seen the district and the communities change 